Okay, it's my great pleasure to uh, have Hans Sittig back for another session. Um, if you haven't watched Hans's previous sessions, um, you need to do that. Uh, Hans participated in the Rhodesian War, serving with the British South Africa Police, the BSAP. And uh, now Hans is going to continue his talks, uh, uh, dealing with his with with his time after the elections and in uh, post Rhodesian Zimbabwe. And uh, I, I, it promises to be very interesting. So, Hans, over to you, my friend. I'm going to cover the period uh, 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 1981 through to 1983, i.e. post-war. And then, uh, if we have the time, I'm going to also cover the period uh, uh, of the years 2000 through to 2006. Um, the reason for that is that... Um, uh, I spent that time uh, doing NGO work, and specifically, I did a lot of work uh, with uh, both uh, Heather and Roy Bennett. And uh, uh, this is all about politics, uh, me meeting Morgan Tsangi Rai, uh, uh, the German government is involved, etc. But okay, let's start. At the outset, um, uh, whatever I say now will only make sense if I tell everyone and that's one of the reasons why, uh, as John knows, for a long time, I uh, I dithered as to whether I should do this first interview, because a lot of what I'm going to say is going to be very controversial. Right. At the outset, in 1980, I was tasked by uh, 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 Mr. Stannard, the, the then uh, director internal, um, with uh, uh, conducting uh, the official liaison with the declared BND Bundesnachrichtendienst representatives at the German embassy in Harare. Almost at the first meeting, I was recruited by the BND to become a BND agent, i.e. a spy. Um, debriefs were easy. Um, I had the regular uh, 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 liaison meetings anyway, and we did the regular liaison, and then uh, we, um, I gave them the information that the CIO didn't really want the Germans to hear. Now, why this was important to the Germans is quite simply this. Um, it, it was formed at the border between South Africa and Zimbabwe, what we used to call the Borowas Curtain, i.e. that is where um, uh, the frontline state stopped and uh, South Africa started. Germany's investment in South Africa was vast. Um, uh, Mercedes-Benz, BMW had built uh, uh, car factories, car manufacturers, uh, car manufacturing factories. There. In fact, the 5 Series BMW was manufactured in South Africa and imported back to Germany. That's how important South Africa was. So there was no way the Germans wanted to lose out on any information possible that would uh, in any way harm these investments. So... In this case, the Germans were actually on the side of South Africa. I'm going to go by happenings. Um, there was a lot of things uh, between 81 and 83 that were running concurrently. Uh, uh, so I'm going to stick to subject matter. Uh, subject number one is a fellow called Garth Bailey. Garth Bailey was the member of an SIS section in 1979 that... Um, operated out of Selops North, commanded by the late uh, Dave Fowler. Um, the SIS section uh, uh, consisted of um, Brian Bartlett, uh, 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 Garth Bailey, uh, Olive Reed, and two others whose names I've forgotten. Come along 1980, Garth Bailey went down south and joined uh, Five Recce in Pelabora. Uh, Brian Bartlett went to uh, Namibia and joined Kufut. And I uh, um, recruited Olive Reed into the CIO in 1981. Okay, come 1982, Garth Bailey comes back on holiday. He's got relatives in Zimbabwe from Pelabora. And by that time, I am now a senior intelligence officer in the CIO. I am uh, second in command to my craft of counterintelligence. Uh, Garth Bailey phones me up and requests a meeting. So we meet in a local restaurant. Have a bit of a chat. And Garth explains to me that um, a number of, in a number of ways, the South Africans didn't keep their promises to him and his family. He had two small children. He was married. And the married accommodation in the heat of Pelabora, and Pelabora regularly goes up to 40 degrees C and above, they were given a caravan. 
with no um, uh, no econ. His pay was so low that half halfway through the month they used to run out of money, and he was having a problem feeding his family. So he didn't know where to turn until he thought, "Let me speak to Hans Siddick." Okay, what he said to me is this: "Recruit me." So he's a walk-in. Recruit me as a source. Um, I will tell you all about uh, five recce's activities in both Angola and Mozambique. I can tell you about what's happening in Angola, but I'm not posted there. Um, Garth said he was he was regularly posted into Mozambique, where he was um, assisting Renamo, um, uh, first in uh, logistics. They supplied uh, five recce's supplied Renamo, and they had plenty of it coming in from from Angola. Supplied Renamo with. Uh, all they need in terms of weaponry, um, you know, AKs, PKMs, uh, uh, RPGs, blah, blah, blah. Um, and he would also train Renamo. Now, Garth also believed that um, his bosses in Palabora wanted him and the other extradition guys in Ivraki to also go operational. So I said to Garth, fine, here's your first report. He has five thousand dollars in cash, and he was, you know, he was beamingly happy. Consider yourself recruited. The the next step then is how do we continue this? So God said to me as follows: He's not going back. And then, just like in the old Rhodesian days, he was six weeks in ten days out. He was going back on that cycle. When he saw me, he was on leave. So he goes back, and he, uh, I said to him, "Okay, do your six weeks, and then when you're back, give me a phone call." Just an innocuous call, just to say hello and uh, chat about something or other, and then I will know you're back. What I will then do is I'll jump into my car. Obviously, I won't go to Palabora. There was a place nearby. I'm trying to... Ah, yeah, it was called Waterfall Boven and Waterfall Honor. Um, and I, th there was a small hotel there. So I said, I will go there, book into the hotel. You you drive there, and then we meet in my hotel room. Okay, fine. So six weeks go by, and uh, exactly that happened. Uh, we, we do the debrief, etc., and everything is hunky dory. So now, shit hot intelligence for the next year is coming in from Garth. Garth is, uh, I said to him, listen, I'm not going to bring money with me every time, just a little bit. So I opened a, an account for Garth at, at Cabs, and by the time this whole thing finished, there was something like $60,000 in there, which was a bloody fortune. Okay. And how this int was being used is, remember I, I talked about Lionel Dyke, he was a captain in the RAR. Come 1982, uh, uh, Lionel Dyke is a full-blown colonel. And um, he has taken with him most of the RAR guys, and there was a, quite a few whites uh, as well. And he is fighting Renamo in Gonorazu, and round about that area. And uh, I didn't pass in the int direct. Uh, my int went to Stenart. Stenart then gave it to the uh, uh, MRD authorities. Military intelligence had an office in Red Brick, also on the ninth floor, and they would brief, uh, they would go and brief uh, Colonel Dyke. The end result of this was, is, is that Dyke now had huge successes against Renamo using that intelligence. And all is well. It became, and this is how, unfortunately, the whole thing ended. Um, at the end of it, um, Minister of uh, State Security, Munangagwa, uh, uh, decided to make political capital out of it. And Stenard and I had agreed that the information was top secret and safe. Th that means that not only is it top secret, it's, it's kept in Stenard safe, and nobody else was meant to see it. However, he had to use some of it uh, in, in briefing the minister. The minister then gives an interview, page one on, of the Herald, boasting about the shit up source that they have in the South African military that's giving them all and sundry about what the South Africans are up to, and that is why Zimbabwe is being so successful. Nah, 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 sort of thing. Well, uh, the end result was uh, when Garth came out of his next deployment, he was dead two days later. Um, the official reason was that he was killed in a swimming accident, which I don't believe for one second, because Garth Hobby had been underwater hockey. He was a, 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 a swimmer by none. So, in a way, I felt, uh, you know, uh, well, I, 
his death was not on my hands, but they were on the hands of the minister. Um, it made me extremely angry. But because uh, it would have been a reason for me to leave. But because of what I've said about the BND connection, I have to stay on. Okay. Case number two. Um, you've heard of, we've all heard of Mandrax. Mandrax is a drug that uh, has been made illegal worldwide, or had been made illegal worldwide in 1981, um, because it can be used as a drug. However, it was still being manufactured illegally in Pakistan. So now, a huge market has opened up for Mandrax in South Africa, um, starting off in Hillbrow. And just to give you some background, the Mandrax being legally manufactured in uh, Pakistan is flown into Zambia. Uh, the quantity of each uh, shipment is 80,000 tablets. 80,000 tablets, each tablet landed in Zambia costs 50 South African cents. So the 80,000 tablets cost 40,000 rand. From Zambia, the suitcase is smuggled into Zimbabwe, from Zimbabwe into South Africa. By the time that tablet hits the market in Hilbra, 80,000 tablets at 10, <coughs> street value 10 rand a tablet, <coughs> 800,000 rand. So they start off with a cost of 40,000 rand and end up with 800,000 in their pockets. Good money. Now, we were approached by a boss, Bureau of State Security, on this matter. And um, uh, Stout called me in and he said, right, here's a local boss representative. And you may recall, I knew the man. Um, I think it was in interview four. I, I, I covered how this guy and I went down to the boss head office. And so we knew each other. And they explained the problem. And they said, right, somebody has to go underground and, and, and become like an illegal operative. And I said, well, how am I going to do that? I mean, everyone knows who I am in, 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 in Zimbabwe. He says, yeah, um, is there some way? And I thought, I said, yeah, but I'm going to lose a lot of friends because of this. Because I'm, I'm going to have to enter the colored and Indian communities. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to go to their parties and socialize with them, etc., to get some sort of creed going. You know? um, and when my friends realize that I have suddenly, as they say in, the, in, in colored jargon, ski tonky, um, they're going to say Citic is mad, you, you know, and, you know, racism in our community in 1982 was still very much alive and well. And a lot of people simply would not want to associate with a guy that was sleeping with colored girls. I was divorced by 1982. So uh, I agreed to do it. Okay, so where do I start? Okay, so I start going to all the nightclubs uh, where coloreds go and start chaffing up colored girls and made a few colored guys. <laughs> they were jealous. And I quickly realized I needed to get some sort of street key going. Um, I also realized that the coloreds, they they pretend to be violent, but most of them are not. In fact, the colored women are more violent than the colored guys. So I went after a girl whose colored boyfriend was a, a, a bodybuilder, a muscle man. And um, she sort of went along with it. He saw it. And she then turned around and said, this honky here is trying to get into my pants. Uh, we were an occupied there at the time, so... He said he wanted to attack me. I said, no, let's take it upstairs. What he didn't know is I had a, a, a Smith & Wesson, <laughs> Smith and Wesson 357 um, uh, uh, in my belt. And as we got upstairs, I took out the Smith and had a, I think it was a four-inch or a six-inch barrel, but it was quite a long barrel. And instead of fist fighting him, I pistol whipped the guy. And I made a mess of him. And it doesn't matter how strong you are, when you're being pistol whipped, and especially with the chance that if you retaliate, I might cop the weapon and shoot the bastard. And he knew I was with the CIO, anyone knew. Um, and all the girls had to watch. After that, uh, this particular incident gave me what is called street creed. Yeah? They knew that Siddiq was a guy that you wouldn't want to cross him. Okay. Now I start getting invited to their houses, uh, specifically more now the Asians, the, the, the Indians and Pakistanis. Uh, two parties that were being attended by colleagues. And then uh, during these, these parties, 
I let it be known that I wasn't coming after my salary, that, uh, you know, I needed to make some extra money, blah, blah, blah. So uh, I said this a few times, and then suddenly one of them pipes up and says, okay, you want to make some money? And I said, yes. He said, okay, um, we have a suitcase here. And I said, right, what's in it? And uh, I, I made him tell me, he said, yeah, it's it's made with 80,000 tablets. You are a member of CIO, right? Smuggling this into South Africa is a problem for us. But you, with your CIO card, you can get through the border in no time at all. And I said, yes, I can. And, um, okay, I'd agreed with Stanard that whatever payments they would make me, I would hand back to him. Uh, and here I was being totally honest. I wasn't being corrupt. And um, they offered me, I think it was 40,000 Rand. And uh, I said, fine, I'll do it. Um, so a few days later, I get into my private car. What was this CIO car? I can't remember, one of them. Um, and drive to the border. They actually followed me. Uh, well, they obviously didn't quite trust me yet. Um, so we get to the border. I flash my CIO card on both sides, number no, three minutes. Right, we get down to Joburg, and they told me to uh, walk into a CD hotel in the center of Joburg, which I did. And once I'm there, go down, and uh, I met some African guys. We talked. They handed me an envelope with 40,000 rand, go up to my room, and handed them the suitcase and Bob the uncle. Now, in order to establish trust, we did that twice in two months. Uh, it was initially 80,000 a month. But in the second meeting, they said that they were opening up markets in Cape Town, Durban, and uh, uh, Port Elizabeth. And so now there would be 80,000 tablets every week. So this is now very alarming to uh, to the boss guys. They said, okay, I think next shipment we, we, we grab them. So um, we did the next shipment. By now, they are no longer following me. They, they are trusting me. It was my, I think it was a third shipment, 80,000 tablets. And, uh, but it goes on. I get to the studio hotel in Joburg, meet the ass downstairs. They give me 40,000 rand in an envelope. And then they identify themselves as senior members of the ANC. So basically, what this has told me, told us and boss, that the African National Congress, the, the now government of South Africa, was financing its activities through the Mandrax market. In fact, they were controlling the bloody market. So having said that, they said to me, okay, here's now 800,000 rand sitting. You have connections in the weapons industry or for weapons in, in Zimbabwe. We, we can give you that money. And you go back and buy weapons and smuggle the weapons because we need those weapons for the armed struggle. Now, I'm not flying by my pants here because this wasn't part of the initial brief. Um, hang on. So I got along with it. <clears throat> and I said to him, just hang on to the money. There's a, there's a few things I need to check out. Of. I didn't want to walk around with 800,000 rand in my pocket. Uh, not my pocket, baby suit. I then asked them to hang on, and uh, I phoned boss, and uh, uh, that afternoon, I met them at some address in Joburg, and I briefed them. I said, okay, right, we won't do away with them yet, we need to take this another step further. So you now go back, pretend to buy some weapons, but don't buy any, and come back a week later. Okay, I did that. I told, I told the ANC guys and that it would take me a week. A week later, I came back down, met them, uh, as it, as instructed by boss, I told them that I had the weapons. So that gave me the 800,000 rand, which, by the way, I handed back to Mr. Stenard. Um, and the agreement was to meet at some bloody disused car park, or was it one of the old? I think it was an old drive in. Um, an old drive in that wasn't being used. That drive ins by the early 80s weren't really in anymore. So they were all just empty lots. We met at a drive-in, and um, they said, you don't attend. Uh, uh, from here, we take over. So the NC guys went there, 
And um, from what I know, boss arrived in a five-ton truck. And then the ANC guys disappeared, never to be heard or seen again. And I don't really want to know either. No. So that's the end of that one. And to my old pal, Cliff Behrens. Now, I've talked about Cliff Behrens in interview four. A man who could scrounge anything from anyone. And uh, Cliff and I indulged in a bit of uh, weapons smuggling uh, uh, um, in 1981. In doing one of these smuggling trips, Cliff and I stayed at a uh, hotel in the center of Joburg. And uh, um, we, we, we each had girlfriends in, in Joburg. Then, and basically, it was to be the girlfriends. And then uh, one evening, uh, Cliff's come, Cliff comes along. And uh, with him are two guys. I recognize them immediately as ex-special branch guys. In fact, uh, they had both been special branch for a while. Um, well, they have both been DIs, but I forget their names now. And in front of Cliff, they said, OK, uh, I said, if you are a member of CIO, blah, 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 we know who you are. Um, we'd like you to work for us. I said, what? Yeah, yeah. I'm not between a rock and a hard place. I'm the, in the middle of uh, South Africa, sitting in a Joburg hotel, talking to, and there were MID, two members of MID. And uh, I had to say, yes, there's nothing else I could do. I said, OK. They said, OK, just go back to Zimbabwe, and you'll be contacted. As soon as I got back, um, I got a hold of Crafter and, and stand up and had a meeting with them. I told them what had happened. They said, what do I do? They said to me, go along with it. Pretend to be recruited, and then you become a double agent. So this is now real James Bond stuff. And I said, fine, um, I'll become a double agent then. Um, but I insisted on a letter. There were three copies. I still have one, so I have documentary proof of this happening. And then I kept one safe, and Crafter kept one as safe as well. The letter stated that I let myself be recruited by the MID in South Africa and with the full knowledge of um, uh, CIO. And um, I was therefore acting under CIO orders to go along with it. And that was my insurance. Should I ever be picked up, I wouldn't be in jail. That letter would make sure I was kept out of jail. Right. Quite a, quite a while passed before I was contacted. I think it was. And then I got a phone call. And I was asked to, uh, uh, to meet. And I think we met at the Coimbra. Um, it wasn't one of the guys that uh, had recruited me. It was someone else, but he knew what I looked like. And um, together we went to a flat in the avenues. Now, um, he said to me that this flat was the MRD safe house in, um, in uh, Harare. And from now on, I'd have full access to it. So he gave me a set of keys and he said to the safe house, I do not, you do not need to worry about electricity, rent, uh, rentals, etc." All of that has been sorted out. Now, I didn't know if they owned the flat or rented it. It was basically a fully furnished flat, uh, quite a large one, three bedrooms, uh, was it one and a half bathrooms, I think, um, uh, fully stocked fridge, everything was there. But there was also the normal spying equipment, uh, the hidden microphones, the open microphones, the tape recorders. Uh, it was all there. Now, so I said to the guy, what do you want me to do? said, you're not going to spy in Zimbabwe. What are you going to do? Is he going to run our agents in Malawi, Kenya, and Tanzania for us? And they will come down on a, on a regular basis and report to you. You then report back to us. So I said, how do I know what these guys look like? He said, when they come down, this guy said, I will be with you to introduce you. And that's what happened. You know, over the next couple of months, I think it was, it's just seven guys there, and, and uh, they were interested in everything that was happening up there. Um, for specifically, uh, Zambia uh, was included as well, specifically because both PAC and ANC had offices in each of those countries. They wanted to know what those guys were up to. So at the end of the day, it was actually, there was no danger involved in it for me. Once I've met the clients, they used to come up regularly. I used to type out the reports and send them on. And I was paid quite nicely for it. Again, money of which I passed on. So, yeah, with all the money I passed on, yeah, I kept CIO going almost. Um, I don't quite remember how that finished. 
uh, I think it just sizzled out. Um, but I, I don't, I, I don't remember how it actually finished. Okay, so that's that one. Fast forward to the year two thousand. I'm working for the German NGO Hellprüfer zur Selbsthilfe, and uh, um, Cyclone Lion has just hit Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Malawi, and caused havoc along the coast, which is why I ended up working for uh, help doing emergency relief work <coughs> into Zimbabwe and Mozambique. A lot of the damage had happened in uh, uh, the district of Chimani Mani. So uh, I went up to Chimani Mani, I recruited some people, I got some uh, uh, transport. Now, the NGO Health Hilfe to Serve Surfer was being run by a cousin of mine called Wolfgang Nieberberg. And Wolfgang basically gave me the job, uh, um, okay, for for a lot of reasons. My business was collapsing. Well, my business was collapsing because all the farms had been taken and I was supplying chemicals to farmers. Suddenly, I had no customers left because all the farmers had been chucked out. So Wolfgang threw me a lifeline by um, giving me that job. So now I'm earning US dollars. I go up to Chimani Mani. I uh, started Chimani Mani Club Hotel initially. Uh, later on, uh, uh, I, um, I hired a, a cabin. And um, the only place to, for, for the whiteies, uh, okay, all the, all the Zano PF types uh, would socialize at the hotel. But the Chimani Mani Club was a going concern at a, at a golf course. And every night that pub was pum pum with people. So I went to the, the Chimani Mani Club and then I met Roy Bennett. Mm. Okay, what all the people there didn't know is Roy and, went, Roy and I went way back. Uh, when Roy had been a, a member of Pachedu, of a Special Projects Desk, um, he wasn't at uh, Pachedu at the 1 to 5 Alpha uh, Massacre base. He had been at the other Pachedu before training people. But I knew Roy from then and uh, we'd always got on well. So we chatted. And Roy mentioned that um, he was uh, going to go for the post of Member of Parliament for uh, Jumani Mani. And uh, he wanted to try. And uh, I said, fine, uh, any help I can give you? And he said, well, let's see. So I reported this back to Wolfgang. And then Wolfgang came back and I saw the German ambassador and I briefed the Pakistani ambassador. And said, right. In this case, I will give you German government funding on the quiet, officially make it project funds, and you will, with those funds, assist the MDC in, uh, or specifically Roy Bennett, in uh, helping him win those elections. So I took that funding, went back to Chimani Mani, and now the whole thing is in progress. Because of Cyclone Line and emergency relief, I was rebuilding clinics, uh, I was rebuilding schools, I built 300 houses. Because I built 300 houses, um, uh, because of Border Timbers who was there, they were owned by Anglo-American. Anglo-American came on board with me, gave me the building material to build 300 houses for free. So the whole thing was growing. Yeah. So I was actually quite busy. Yeah. Then we were doing uh, uh, emergency feeding. And suddenly, Food became a weapon. Um, all the other NGOs that, that were operating there, and I wasn't the only NGO, a lot of them, in fact, all of them except for me, had sided with the ruling party. And ruling party guys were using food as a weapon. So if a distribution was being made by the ruling party in a uh, part of Chimani Mani supported, uh, that supported uh, uh, Zana PF, they got food. If the part of Chimani Mani that should be fed uh, and uh, was supporting the MDC, there was no food for them. So with the German funds, I went and bought it was like something like 2,000 tons of maize and sugar, beans and salt, you bloody name it. And I gave royal control over that 2,000 tons. So I have got to hear of it. So what we did is, we got border pin timbers, part of Anglo-American, to give me one of their warehouses. So all the food was stored there. And 
the thinking was they there wouldn't be um, a tech. Uh, I mean, uh, Anglo American is a, an international company, uh, a big investor. They wouldn't they attack the end. They didn't. So my, my food was safe. However, I had to establish forward warehouses for the distribution to be efficient. One of these was at a place called Bumba. Now, I've been working there for about I think, I think six months. The program was renewed. And I went on a bit of a spot of leave. So I took the family down to Mschlanga. Funnily enough, Roy was there as well. And um, I'm sitting there in a cafe in Mschlanga. Roy comes up to the, uh, sit with me, has a coffee. And he said, right, the shit's at the fan in Chimani Mani. I said, what's happened? Well, there has been what is now known as the Battle of Bumba. <laughs> I said, what happened in Bumba? He said, yeah, you, you've kept 30 guys there to do distribution. I said, yeah, 30 guys working for help. Well, these 30 guys were attacked by 400 so-called war veterans. So these are these weren't war veterans. They were children from age 10 up to 20-something. Yeah, just rebel. And the police were also there, but they did nothing. They just stood and watched. And basically, they beat the shit out of your 30 guys. Your guys have been taken to Chimani Mani police station. I believe they're being tortured. And they're being charged with something or other. So I said, okay, it means I'm going to have to cut short my holiday. So I left the family there. I flew back to Zimbabwe. And I went up to Chimani Mani. I went to the police station, demanded to see my prisoners. And initially they said no. On the way back to from the cells to the police station, I am introduced to a senior assistant commissioner who happens to be the officer commanding Manikanan. I sat down with him and he gave me a long spiel how he broke the law, etc. So I said to him, How can I break the law distributing food? You know, just, you know well, it's a, it's a, this and that regulation. Oh, bullshit. I said to him, I'll tell you what, I'm calling the German ambassador, I'm calling the European Union ambassadors, uh, and we're going to have it out with you. Oh, this guy's on the phone. The next thing is, I've got the head of CIO for legal land coming. I'm being given death threats, quietly, around the corner, uh, threatening me and my family. So I said, okay, come. I'm not scared of you. And you know I'm not scared of you. But what I didn't know, they thought I was a German-German. They didn't know I was Hanseatic ex-special branch at CIO. They thought, being a German from Germany, I was easily intimidated. So they were totally taken aback by my reaction. Um, as it turns out, nothing ever happened to me or my family. It, it stayed with the threats. And um, because of the ambassador in the EU, um, my men were released. And most of them had to be taken to, to hospital to be treated because they had been tortured. But now they have a meeting about all this. And now the senior assistant commissioner, the CIO, the district commissioner, blah, blah, blah. All the heads of the tribes are having a big meeting in a hall near the Chimani Mani Hotel. Now, for the purpose of this, uh, I said, All right, you're discussing me and what happened. I said, yes. I said, I want to attend. I said, no, you're barred from attending. I said, okay, fine. I'm going to have a drink in the pub at the Chimani Mani Hotel. And uh, I said, they're having a, a whiskey and coke. And along comes a little messenger boy. Ah, oh, they want you, Mr. Sidney. And I said, I'll tell you what. Tell them you couldn't find me. You can't find me. That's it. The right bag is, oh, I can't find Mr. Sidney. So the whole thing ended up with no results. But they weren't going to give up that easily. That night, um, uh, we went back to Charles Wood Estates, to uh, uh, Roy Bennett's farm. And... Uh, we had a meeting there of all the guys running the program. And in the middle of the meeting, we were invaded by all vets and the CIO, the CIO and you bloody name it, swearing and shouting and wanting to, to have a go. And it was Roy's number two, a bloke called Rocky Stone, uh, ex-Intef guy from Metabee And Roy, Roy speaks... The local lingo, he speaks three or four African languages fluently. Rocky was the same. And unlike 
royal, Rocky was a real diplomat. And Rocky managed to defuse the whole lot and uh, got everyone to calm down. Okay. So now I'll carry on with the program. Roy, Heather is pregnant with uh, uh, their third child. Okay, what I'm doing the program, a guy comes to me and he says, okay, the war vets have raided Roy's house at one child's food estate. They've assaulted Heather. Heather is in the hospital and she's aborted the baby. Ah, uh, so shit, no, this can't be happening. Um, they have smeared shit on the walls. So uh, I went down and uh, said to Roy, what help can I give you? He just shook his head. Um, and uh, his priority was to just support Heather. So I reported this back. And, uh, you know, that, that was a sad incident. Shortly after that, there was a full invasion of Charleswood Estate. And Roy and Heather were forced off the estate. They... Um, Roy was going to grow coffee there. He had 5,000 acres of coffee. And he just managed to reap the first crop. And the war vets were going to try and steal that crop. And this is where I now came in. Um, I had a whole lot of trucks of distribution. That night, um, we came in and there was 160 tons of, uh, of coffee. We took 160 tons of coffee of Charleswood and we hid them, not in one of my warehouses, but in another warehouse of a friend of mine in Manika, uh, in, uh, in Mutari. So when the war vets came the following day to steal the coffee, it wasn't there. Um, Roy eventually managed to sell that coffee, and that coffee helped him um, uh, through the years to come. But it was the only coffee crop that he would ever reap. Um, okay, Roy now stays uh, in Harare. In fact, he's, uh, I was on Fisher Avenue, and uh, he was at a house, uh, what was a road, just around the corner from me, big girl. And MDC has got a lot of support. So finance is not a problem. Uh, logistics is not a problem. The problem with Roy was is, is that he had to keep on moving around. Like the house near me, he only stayed at for a couple of weeks. And then when Zanopev found out and started sending guys around, he moved to a house in Aruba. So it carried on. Um, and he kept offices at that pig farming place, that pig place, um, famous for its pork sausages. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of the name. Anyway, they had a big factory right in, uh, uh, in the industrial sites. And Roy had gotten a whole floor, the whole of first floor of their office block. He was given by them to use his offices. So now Roy and I, Roy and I would liaise regularly um, uh, at the offices. Um, the 2000 election should have been won by the MDC, but uh, through some cheating, Mugabe managed to get an extra seat or so. Roy should have been Minister of Agriculture, but he, was, he never managed to become Minister of Agriculture. Um, they then arrested Roy. It was the first of three times he was arrested. And he stayed here, kept him in for six months. During that time, uh, Fiona and I, uh, Fiona was my second mother of my children, my three children. Um, uh, well, three out of four. Um, and uh, Fiona and I would, would sort of keep Heather going, you know, with, with moral support. Um, and uh, that that really given him a shit time in jail. Um, but after six months, he was released. And death threats were coming to uh, Morgan Sangura. So the German government empowered me to purchase two Isuzu twin camps. In, uh, in South Africa. We then took them to a company that bulletproof vehicles. So we supplied the MDC, or especially Morgan, with two bulletproof uh, Asusa twin cap vehicles to make sure that the death threats uh, couldn't be realized. What was also starting then is I gave both Ryan and Morgan the ability, and uh, my place in Fisher Avenue was huge. Um, I had something like 1,200 square meters on the roof. Uh, the property was two hectares. I had everything here. Yeah. And um, I, I gave both Morgan and Roy the ability to hold small meetings at my house. Um, so uh, all the places that are being watched by CIO um, uh, weren't being used and people, uh, the government wouldn't know as to who was talking to who. Uh, specifically in this case, 
was the diplomats, um, the German diplomats, uh, uh, the EU diplomats, uh, uh, British, British diplomats, uh, etc. All used that facility I gave them. So I ended up being, how should I say, in the shadows, quite an influential person. Now, I brought Olaf Reed back into it. Roy wanted the MDC to have some sort of armed wing. Okay, it never really got off the ground, but I, I got Olaf to to agree to go along with us. And um, Roy gave him a, a few uh, guys who were serving officers in the Zimbabwe National Army. And um, I had a big bribe for them uh, at the house. There was something like 40 guys there. And uh, I said to Olaf, okay, uh, how do we arm? Okay, these blokes have got arms, but obviously they will need arms that uh, are not uh, 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 on the on the radar. And he said, "Yeah." I said, "Okay." I don't know if I've mentioned this, but in Cliff Barrens's Cliff had gone by then, but I knew where they were. Had buried three trunks of uh, special forces weapons. In, uh, in Yanga, in the Cliffs Cottage there. So Olaf and I went up there, and we dug up one of them. I thought, you know, let's start small. And in that were FNs, a few AKs, uh, a lot of rounds, grenades. We took that back and we said, okay, here's a donation from us. I wanted to pay us, so I said, no, it's a donation. But you must hide it well. Okay. But the whole thing fizzled out. It, it never really came to fruition. Okay. Um, then, on two more occasions over the next couple of years, Roy was arrested. Then comes the next election, 2004, 2005. It was 2005. And the violence on this one is even worse than the last. Uh, the last one. And um, Mugabe won it. Roy then left, had to leave the country. And funny enough, so did I. In 2006, I went to Cape Town, opened up my own business there. Um, because uh, my position in Zimbabwe just wasn't tenable. And funny, Roy was also in Cape Town for a while. Yeah. And that's basically how the whole thing finished. Okay. Um, John, that's all I have to say. Uh, did you manage to record it well?